Alrighty. Um, so thank you to those in the waiting room, uh, Nancy, Robert, we appreciate y'all waiting there. Um, as we are going to start off with a bit of a basic dive into gender and sexuality, um, I do want to begin with an acknowledgement of the land that I'm coming from, uh, as well as the land that North Van Arts offices uh, and our activities and our programming are on. Um, so the unceded territories of the Squamish and the uh, Tsleil-Waututh peoples, um, what's colonially known as North Vancouver, as well as West Vancouver, sometimes the North Shore. Um, there are a lot of different names for this place, but it's important to note and remember uh, Indigenous people have several different names for uh, places all across the North Shore. Um, so you can uh, check out and learn about a ton of those from the Squamish Tsleil-Waututh Nations websites. Make sure you're following them and their socials as well as uh, the North Shore Culture Compass, where you can learn uh, a bunch of words like Aslaan, which is uh, a Squamish Nation community near where I live in what's colonially known as Lower Lonsdale or the Shipyards District. So um, let's jump into gender. Uh, but before that, Joyelle or Leo, um, I would love for you to introduce yourself. And I forgot to introduce myself because I know our uh, waiting room guests. I will note um, I'm the social engagement manager for North Van Arts. Um, it's a super fun name that uh, essentially means I do social media uh, and arts advocacy projects all around, uh, among many other hats. Um, Leo, let's jump to you. Hi, my name is Leo. Um, I'm currently the Culture Compass Assistant for the summer with North Van Arts. Um, Andy briefly alluded to it already, but the Culture Compass is an initiative North Van Arts that maps culture all over the North Shore. Um, I'm a white settler. I'm originally from what is called Saskatchewan, uh, specifically Tree Six territory, traditional homelands of the Blackfoot, Cree, and people. Um, I'm currently finishing my Bachelor in Human Geography. And after that, I want to continue working and studying at the intersection of place and art. Thank you. Joyelle. Hi, my name is Joyelle, and my pronouns are she, her. I live in Port Moody on the territory of the Tsleil-Waututh and Coquitlam Nations. And I work at North Van Arts as the arts education manager, and currently I am in week four of seven weeks of Camp Creative. Hmm, how's that going so far? Well, we've been having some a lot of fun this week, so it's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I hear uh, just singing and music and arts galore, so uh, very happy to have you at those camps, Joyelle. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's begin with basic concepts of the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Um, North Van Arts uses this term specifically 2S LGBTQ+, but we recognize that you might have heard the term LGBT, you might have heard the term GISM, you might have heard the term LGBT+, plus uh, many other letters that uh, we'll go through in a sec. Um, but no matter what you've heard our community called, um, I often refer to it as the queer and trans community. Um, because in essence, everyone in this community uh, has a gender or a sexuality that differs from the norm. Um, the, the norm that is, you know, a straight man and a wife and they get married, they have children that are straight and cisgender. And uh, that's the storybook of how it is, but that's not the reality of how it is. And in reality, there are a lot of differences that each of us have. So. Um, Joyelle, I would love for you to start us off with gender, uh, to talk a little bit about what that is. Well, people have a lot of different ideas about what gender is, um, and it can be a little bit confusing because I know people talk about hormones or chromosomes or haircuts or sex, and we have these ideas that we can look at someone and know their gender. And we don't know that until they tell us. 
And it's a bit of a trick to get used to trying to check our old habits of gendering people who we don't know. Hmm. So I think when it comes to gender, starting to uh, speak in a way that is more gender neutral is a great place to start so that we don't make assumptions about who somebody is. Yeah, um, very well said that gender is who you are and uh, it can be a very personal thing. So uh, it's not necessarily up to the public to know what everybody's gender is. Um, but as we say, gender refers to who you are. Uh, sexuality often refers to who you're attracted to, whether that's a sexual or romantic attraction. Um, Leo, do you want to talk a bit more about that? For sure. So sexuality can change and evolve over your life, or it can stay consistent the entire time. Um, and as Andy mentioned, it can be a sexual attraction or a romantic attraction. Um, for some people, they're not the same. For some people, they are sexually and romantically attracted to the same type of people or same gender as people. Other people aren't. All of these experiences are all valid. Um, the biggest point that we can make when it comes to both sexuality and gender is that there are sort of infinite possibilities uh, of experiences and definitions. There are a lot of identities. Um, and in this hour, we're not going to be able to cover every single thing. We're not going to attempt to speak for every single member of the community. We're just trying to give you a broad overview to hopefully equip you to do your own exploring and learning after this is over. Yes, to learning and exploring uh, year round, not just during Pride as well. Um, so I mentioned, uh, I'll, I'll say, <laughs> this is like the most letters I can think of, the 2S LGBTQQIAA P, D, N, B, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z. It is the longest acronym there exists, as far as I can tell scientifically. Um, and there are a lot of different identities in there. Um, so one of the things I hear a lot is people saying uh, there are too many letters or there's too much to remember. There's too much that it's too complex. And I don't know. Um, I just don't know that I'll get all of it or that I'll know all of it. So I want to begin by saying you don't have to know all of it. Just know that genders and sexualities come in many different forms. Um, and while technically the gender identity and sexuality minority, the G-I-S-M, is a shorter acronym, I've heard some people use it, um, it's not very widely used. So when people say there are too many letters, I always ask them, why don't you use the G-I-S-M? And they're like, oh, well, I, didn't, I didn't know that that existed. And I'm like, well, maybe research is part of the problem that you're not looking into learning about these things. Um, so, uh, you can use the GISM, but if you had asked my personal opinion, I really like what Jane Lynch said. Um, the name needs to get bigger and it needs to get longer and we need to be able to celebrate all of these different identities and differences um, before eventually, maybe one day, the acronym might get smaller, um, but we don't know when that day might be. So for now, um, I think it is really important that we include as many differing experiences as possible because uh, in my future, everybody is queer or trans. So, uh, Joyelle, would you share a little bit about what the word or the term two-spirit means? Yes, and I love that idea, what you were just saying about, you know, the ideal future is that everyone is queer. I, I hope that one day we break down this idea that um, there is a standard or a norm at all when it comes to gender and sexuality. Um, and we can just embrace everyone's individual um, expression and, um, and sexual orientation as something that is just unique. There's a lot of conflict that comes up uh, both within and without the, with, I don't know, outside of the queer community, when we try to fit everything in to a, bin a, to a, to a false binary. Uh, and what I love about this 
um, when you talk about two us or two spirited, um, it's an English term. And, and so the original indigenous term was more encompassing. Uh, it wasn't, you are this and that. It's more uh, about you are something other that doesn't have to be defined in terms of a binary. And I think it's fascinating that when you translate this very vast concept uh, from Indigenous cultures into English, that it becomes two-spirited. And again, it's, it's trying to fit us into a binary. Um, so it's an interesting thing how language plays a big part in this. Um, but in terms of two-spirit, this is a very general concept that has been used to encompass several different Indigenous cultures. Um, and it is, um, it encompasses people who within Indigenous cultures had a very special role in their community. And not all queer people who are Indigenous are going to identify as Two-Spirit, but some will. Um, so uh, like as, as a general note, our, our panelists today might identify as queer or trans, but we don't represent all identities within our community either. So like my cat here is, is saying, we just, <laughs> you know, you can't do a Zoom meeting without a cat interfering. Um, we are experts in our own experiences. And when people tell you that they identify as two-spirited or as any other uh, queer identity, it's really important for you to accept and understand that that is their truth uh, and not to question uh, whether that feels true to you or not because it's not your identity. Yeah, important to note that it is, um, it's an English term and so it, uh, it can't do justice and it can't um, uh, describe all of these experiences that um, we uh, three as settlers don't identify with, but um, it is important to note. And that's why um, you'll see North Van Arts putting two spirit at the beginning of our acronym, 2SLGBTQ+. Um, you might say, well, we don't include asexual people or we don't include non-binary people. Um, as someone who is non-binary and a settler, I'm, uh, I want to note that um, it is important to highlight Two-Spirit and Indigenous people first in the acronym um, to highlight these voices that were for so long um, and continue to be um, colonized that uh, this attempted assimilation is not right. Um, so we can decolonize our language more by continuing to learn about Indigenous uh, genders and sexualities and uh, experiences that differ from this colonial narrative that we've all been taught. Um, so Leo, would you like to share about the term lesbian and slash gay? They kind of go together. For sure. Um, so as homosexual began to feel a little bit clinical, lesbian and gay became the mainstream term to refer to same sex attraction in the late 1960s and early 70s. Gradually, what was formerly called the gay liberation movement became gained theme the phrase gay and lesbian became more popular as a way to highlight the similar yet separate issues faced by women in the fight for tolerance. And then gay is sometimes still used as an umbrella term by lesbians and others in the queer community. Like you will hear a lot about gay culture or queer culture. A lot of people sort of use them interchangeably, I would say, especially some younger people, but it can also refer specifically to gay men. Yeah, like I identify with the term gay, for example, but I like gay in a more general, broad sense, not necessarily a gay man. Um, but I also know that for a lot of older folks, the word queer is so hurtful that they don't want that to be um, the broader, the more general umbrella term, and they want uh, gay to be the umbrella term. Um, so we'll talk a lot about umbrella terms today. Um, but gay is one of those. Uh, lesbian is not often used as an umbrella term, although I would say it includes a lot of different kinds of femmes um, and a lot of varying experiences as well. 
So uh, bisexual, Joyelle, would you share about what that word means? So someone who is attracted to people of their gender or other identities could identify as bisexual. Uh, there's a lot of stereotypes that bisexual people are faced with, uh, often that it's a transitional stage or a cover for promiscuity. Uh, and that has been the center of fraught conversations within the LGBTQ community for a long time. And a lot of people are speaking out now about bisexual erasure, which is the persistent questioning uh, or negation of bisexual identity. And I see this particularly uh, with women who identify as bisexual, but are in um, a marriage to a man that comes happens quite often. Um, so you hear things like, oh, no, you're just bi curious or you're just questioning or uh, you just don't want to pick a side, these kinds of ideas. And um, and there's also a concern that the prefix bi reinforces that uh, male, female, gender binary, and isn't inclusive enough. And some people uh, prefer the term pansexual, which is more inclusive of all gender identities. But to all our bisexual friends out there, we see you and your sexuality is valid. Mm -hmm. um, that's, yeah, that's a really important uh, note that by uh, B-I, meaning two, is a binary that um, can be a very exclusive thing. Um, and our community is supposed to be more inclusive than that. It doesn't make sense for uh, the most inclusive community or one of the most uh, to be also one of the most exclusive communities. Um, so on that note, the word transgender, the fun T, um, this one is also very uh, binary or it can be very binary. Um, so I'll call this an umbrella term for people whose gender identity or gender expression differs from the biological sex they were assigned at birth. So uh, it really important to note the word transgender doesn't always indicate a transition. Um, and folks like me, I prefer generally not to use the word transition because um, it implies like a finished product or like a perfection of a person. Um, and I, I honestly don't know, like, when is your transition done? Who decides whether you are fully transitioned or not? Um, and I've had a lot of people ask me that, that it, it is a very strange question to come from a stranger at the nail salon, but it happens. Um, and in those times, um, I always like to bring up the legendary historian or her historian, Susan Stryker. Um, she noted that a transgender person is not someone who is transitioned from one sex to another in the binary sense of the word, um, but instead a trans person is someone who has transcended get transcended the expectations that we've created within genders. So uh, transcendent people are this marvelous future where um, magically anybody can wear pants. What a world where women and men can both wear pants. And it's like, this is magic. Like this is utterly unimaginable. And yet trans people have been doing it for millennia. Um, same thing with bathing suits. You can find photos in the 50s with men wearing singlets, um, which are now wrestling singlets. But for a long time, those were the norm for men to be wearing those singlets as uh, bathing suits. And now today, most commonly singlets uh, and onesies, things like that are worn by women. So, or femmes, as we'll often say, um, just because we don't like to get too binary. Uh, here at the panel, but um, there is a binary. I know it's hard to say, there is a binary that exists. Um, we try to talk about it in the most inclusive terms possible. So we'll often say femmes and mask people or uh, trans mask, trans femme people rather than men and women, just because there are a lot of non-binary people um, who might not identify as men or women. Um, but we will get to those other uh, experiences of gender in a moment. Um, I want to give a quick note, transgendered is not a word. Um, it is often used as one. 
there is no such thing to be transgendered. Um, often people forget that you can be a trans person. You are not a trans. Um, very important distinction here. So um, Leo, would you want to share about the term transsexual? For sure. So this is definitely an older term. Um, and in contrast to what Andy just talked about with transgender kind of being an umbrella term, transsexual is not. Um, it originated in the medical and psychology communities, and it's not commonly used, and especially anymore. Um, some people may use transgender and transsexual to mean the same thing, um, but there are also people who refer to transsexual specifically when they talk about the status of medical intervention. So like, especially with some older trans folks, they may feel comfortable referring to themselves as transsexual if in their opinion, you know, they have undergone whatever medical surgeries or interventions they felt were necessary. But it is very much not a word that I would say is in fashion anymore. Um, I think because it doesn't really have that nuance to it, um, it's not very helpful. Like there are, there's better vocabulary that we have now that we can use to describe ourselves or have people describe to us. Um, I do want to note, though, some people, especially like older folks, like I mentioned, that are trans, they might use the term. And if they self-identify, not going to fight them on it, of course. If they feel that that is their identity, that is completely valid for them. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Susan Stryker uses the term uh, transsexual. But again, it's kind of like the opposite of queer. A lot of young people like the word queer. Older folks don't. A lot of older folks use the term transsexual. A lot of younger folks don't. Um, there can be differences. Wow. Joyelle, would you uh, share about what the word cisgender means, um, as well as assigned blank at birth? Yeah, so cisgender, I remember when I first started hearing the term cisgender, and I was very confused at first. I think a lot of people are. Uh, so, but it really is simple. It just means someone whose gender identity matches the sex that they were assigned with at birth. Um, and it's kind of, I think the reason I had a hard time with it is because it, it's almost invisible because there's this expectation, um, in our society that, that everyone is born, uh, with their gender identity matching their sex. Um, so these terms, uh, assigned female at birth or assigned male at birth, assigned intersex at birth or unassigned at birth, really talk about how this is just uh, a marker of a person's sex. It is not a marker of a person's gender. And there's very much a distinction there. Hmm. Um, yeah, I, it's important to note, uh, not everybody has access to what they were assigned at birth as well. Um, that for some folks, especially within the intersex community, um, there is not a lot of information on your past because unfortunately, um, some people are known to hide information from the queer and trans community. Um, and when it's your own medical information, it's all the more important that it is yours and that it is yours to, um, to share or not. Um, so the term ally, this one, I put a question mark on it because uh, in the long acronym, I have seen some people put uh, LGBTQQIAA because they want to include allies in the community. Um, I personally don't feel that allies should be included in the community. If you are a uh, heterosexual and a cisgender person, neither your sexuality nor your gender is from the community. If you are that person, um, I would call you an ally perhaps, um, but only if, only if you agree with us, uh, the community in supporting equal civil rights, gender equality, um, our movements, our protests. Uh, if you also take action by challenging homophobia, biphobia, transphobia, all queer phobias, um, by challenging those in your workplaces and wherever you are. Um, that's what true allyship is, is making sure that you're making the world a safer place for everyone, 
24 seven. It's not just like a part-time gig. It's not like off the side of your desk. Um, allyship is a, a lifelong commitment to, to be there with us. And so um, I don't believe you should be there with us in the acronym because my hot take is that uh, if you are straight or cisgender, um, I like to call those people future queers or future trans people. Um, and I think you already do have a letter within the community. You have questioning. Q for questioning can be your word to be not sure about whether you belong or don't belong in the community. Um, we're very inclusive that way. And I think questioning works, uh, but personally, I don't think we should have ally be in the community. Any differing thoughts? I think we have talked about this before. No, I 100% agree about that. Um, there's a very big difference between being an ally and being a queer person. Um, and if you're not an ally, like you said, what if you're if you're only an ally at the convenient times, like uh, you know those companies who love to sponsor Pride but do nothing to actually support the queer community throughout the rest of the year, that's not allyship. Changing your logo to a rainbow version of your same logo, not allyship. Exactly. Mm. Leo, do you agree or disagree? I mean, I think you both covered it well. Um, I mean, to, I think to be an ally to the community, you are inherently not part of the community. Otherwise, you wouldn't be an ally to the community, um, which isn't to say that, you know, allyship isn't important or needed. Uh, it just is in periphery of the community. It's not within. Although, as Andy pointed out, maybe an, an ally definitely could be in the community in the future. It's not like you're an ally, so you can never be queer. Yes. The door is always open. <laughs> Mm hmm. Important to note, the door is always open for you. Um, and also, I guess there are allies sort of, there are layered allies, um, because I have some cisgendered homosexual, sorry, I literally just said cisgendered after I told y'all not to say that. I am so sorry, just slipped out there. Uh, but I have some friends who are cisgender, um, who are allies to the transgender communities. Um, historically, trans people face tons more violence, um, especially trans people of color. Statistically, um, it is up to us to, you, to protect our most vulnerable and to take care of ourselves, but allies have to help in that as well. Um, so uh, we do have allies from outside the community. There can also be allies within the community. Um, lots of different kinds of allyship. And also it's not exclusive to the 2S LGBTQ plus community. Um, allyship, you can uh, be an ally in a lot of different ways, but specifically we're talking about an ally to our community. So, um, Leo, would you take us to the next word, queer? Yeah, yeah I got my favorite one. Um, <laughs> so queer, which we have touched on a little bit already, but it is a term used by some people in the community. It is not used by others. Um, as we sort of mentioned, it's a lot more popular with sort of younger generations. Um, a very like valid reason for this is a, it was previously a slur or used in a derogative way. Um, so especially for a lot of older folks, I would say from what I've noticed my personal experience, particularly a lot of older gay men may really associate the word with like nothing positive. It has a quite a negative connotation. Um, and but for a lot of younger people, it has been one of those words that's been reclaimed. Um, so in the process of that, it's being like, you can't use this word to hurt us anymore because we're using it to describe ourselves in a way that's really beautiful. Um, and I think one of the things that I like the most about queer, and I think that a lot of other people do as well, is that it sort of encompasses just that sh the whole acronym or even that short one of being a gender or sexuality minority. Um, when people say queer, they could be talking about their sexuality, they could be talking about their gender identity, they could be talking about either. So it's both sort of like a broad way to introduce yourself to a community or be part of a community, and then you can also keep some aspects to yourself. Um, so it's, it's really nice for that, I know, like it's nice to be able to meet somebody and to be like, oh, I'm queer and you don't have to 
I would like give more information than that at that time. And you, and similarly, if they tell you that you might understand that you have like sort of a shared kinship, but you don't need to know the specifics yet. And I think something about that that's nice too, is it sort of reminds queer people in the community, all the different letters, you know, the whole acronym that we do really all have this like shared common experience at the end of the day. And that there is that sort of solidarity with each other, even though it is such a diverse community and there's so many different types of people in it, not even just different sexualities and um, gender identities, but anything else, right? If any person can be in the queer community, you have every single type of person in there, basically. Um, I would say as an ally or as somebody who you know, doesn't identify as queer, I wouldn't ever use this word to describe anybody. Um, people, I think it's, it's solely for people to self-identify with. If somebody hasn't given you permission to describe them as queer, wouldn't say it because again for some people it just has too negative of a connotation and also I think for myself at least hearing it from somebody else who isn't queer would be a little bit strange to hear it's hard to know that their intentions are completely good with that statement um, it's something at least I know personally I would prefer to be using myself mm. Jael do you have any thoughts on this word yeah, you know, Leo, I really loved what you said about how um, this can be used as an umbrella term and that you don't necessarily want to get into the specifics of your gender or sexual identity uh, in every situation. And so queer is a term that can be used uh, that it encompasses everyone and it's very, it's a very welcoming term. Um, and I use and identify with queer quite a bit, uh, and I love it. Um, but I think it's also important what you said about how this is not a, a term that you can give to someone else if they have not previously identified with it. And uh, I would say that's also important to say about any of these terms is that don't make assumptions about how somebody else identifies. Wait until they have told you uh, which of these words feels right to them before using that word, because pretty much all of these words have been weaponized at one point or another uh, and used in harmful ways. So it's really, it's really important to respect what words feel right for what people. Hmm. Yeah, there are some words that I'm like, afraid of them becoming a part of the community. But I know that um, in the end, just speaking on slurs in general, um, in the end, there could be a bunch of people who identify with different terms and other generations perhaps that have uh, differing opinions. But the one thing I'll, I'll say on this is um, seeing people who reclaim slurs, um, reclamation can be a very empowering thing. Um, and uh, when you do hear someone, um, for example, I don't use the word dyke for myself, uh, but I have lots of friends who self-identify with that or put it in a bio. Um, that word has uh, been used a lot, but it could be another part of the community um, eventually if uh, folks decide to include that word. There are a lot of different kinds that we have. Um, certainly transsexual is probably the most uh, debated, I think, from the trans community. But um, yeah, I, I believe that if you can reclaim it, all the power to you. Mm -hmm. So Joyelle, do you want to uh, give a little bit about the word questioning? Yes. As you already alluded to. <laughs> and this is another one that I... I... I think has often been used uh, in a derogatory term, uh, you know, to, to assume that um, there is some kind of magical end point that you are supposed to arrive at and you're just part way through. Uh, and I, I think what Leo said earlier about how, you know, our, our gender and sexual identities can change over our lifetime. So uh, when I was younger, I identified as bisexual. And now I identify as lesbian or gay or queer. Those are words that fit with me. So at any point in your life, you could be questioning. This is not something that only happens during your teenage years. 
Uh, and it's just a term used to describe anybody who's in a process of discovery and exploration about their sexual orientation, gender identity, gender expression, or a combination thereof, which I think encompasses a lot of people. I know it certainly uh, describes where I'm at right now, uh, two years out from the point when I decided that I identified more as lesbian than bisexual. I'm still trying to figure out what that means. And I think it'll take me a while. So uh, I want to encourage people to not feel like you have to rush through the questioning and somehow arrive at some magical endpoint because that, uh, that process is a beautiful one. And it, uh, it doesn't, you don't need to hurry. It's a, it's a beautiful journey. Mm -hmm. It is so beautiful. Um, yeah, there can be ups and downs like any journey. But um, it is important to give yourself the space to explore those questions and to ask yourself before you are questioning to anybody else. Um, it's important to have those conversations and check in with yourself and see, maybe I do really feel differently than I thought I did before. Um, and I appreciate what you said at, at all ages as well. It is important to check in with yourself. Um, the word intersex. Uh, this one is, um, well, it's not as well known. I'll say that. Um, intersex is not as well known, but essentially it's a term for someone who is born with biological sex characteristics um, that aren't traditionally associated with male or female bodies. Um, so intersexuality is uh, not technically a sexual orientation or a gender identity. Um, intersex people uh, often have um, varying physical uh, experiences of chromosomes, for example. Um, a lot of people think there's XX and there's XY and there's no in between and there are no other variables that go into that and there are no other possible combinations of uh, uh, body parts, indoors, outdoors, whatever that may be, whether you have more masculine hormones, but you were raised as a woman or vice versa, uh, there are a lot of differing experiences that intersex people can have. So there isn't, um, there isn't like a certificate you can bring uh, because like we said earlier, uh, some people are unassigned at birth and they might find out later in life that they're intersex based on some of these biological characteristics medical history that you might not have access to. Um, and some people are assigned intersex at birth. Um, really important st statistic to share is that uh, the same number of red-haired people, naturally born gingers, it's about one in 2000. For every red-haired person you see, there could be another intersex person on that same bus because every one in 2000 babies are born intersex. So while you might see uh, a lot of red-haired people where we are in Vancouver, um, there, you know, people take the bus with all sorts of hair colors. Just look at Joyelle. Um, we do support dyeing of the hair. Just wanna make that clear, as clear as possible. <laughs> um, but for people who are natural born redheads, um, they have the same statistic. So important to know that uh, we should not erase these identities because sexuality and gender have so many intricate possibilities, but also just the human body can have so many varying different experiences. Um, it's not fair to say, well, your experience is invalid just because I've never heard of it before. Um, do your own research. And so if intersex is new to you, I definitely recommend you learn a bit more about it and also pay to hear from people who are intersex. Uh, likewise with people who are two-spirit, people who come from experiences that we on this panel don't necessarily have. Um, so next, Leo, would you share about the terms asexual, ace, and aromantic? For sure. So asexual is someone who experiences little to no sexual attraction. Um, and that is not to be confused with aromantic people who experience little to no romantic attraction. Um, and asexual people do not always identify as aromantic. Aromantic people do not always identify as asexual. Uh, some people do identify as both, but some people, for instance, may say they are 
asexual, but they are biromantic. So they might not experience sexual attraction, but they are attracted to genders similar to theirs and genders not similar to theirs. Um, so, and the terminology is sort of similar in that vein. You know, you can have homoromantic, heteromantic, biromantic, and it might also be the other flip of the coin. Some people might feel that they only have sexual attraction and they don't experience romantic attraction. I think that's a shorter and sweet one, but I think that encompasses. And Joyelle, do you want to take pansexual? Yes. So I alluded to this earlier when I spoke about bisexual. So a pansexual means someone who is attracted to people of all gender identities, or it could be someone who is attracted to a person's qualities or characteristics instead of uh, what their gender identity is. So they, they might say, I'm just attracted to, to different people. I'm not attracted to one particular gender or the other. And the prefix pan means all. So that rejects that gender binary that uh, a lot of people have a problem with in the word bisexual or in a lot of the other terms that we use. Uh, so it's much more uh, generous and all encompassing term. And it's really cool that uh, the conversation around being pansexual has come into popular media uh, with the singer um, Miley Cyrus identified as pansexual in 2015 and Janelle Monet uh, came out as pansexual in a Rolling Stones article. So it's exciting to see these conversations become a lot more mainstream. Mm -hmm. We play Janelle Monet so often in our office. Um, can't get enough of her music. Check it out if you've never heard of her. Um, oh God, love her so much. Right? Yeah, if you haven't heard of her, like, I'm a little bit ashamed, but uh, still accepting and inviting. So uh, I invite you to go and listen to Janelle Monet. <laughs> um, let's talk about demisexual and gray sexual. I'll go through these two. Um, demisexual is someone who uh, doesn't really experience sexual attraction unless they have a strong emotional um, but not necessarily romantic bond with someone. Um, so you need a connection with someone that feels good before you can consent and give consent to uh, experience anything sexually with your partners. Um, gray sexual is similar to asexual. Um, it's kind of someone who experiences asexuality on a scale. Um, so there's, there's a gray, um, spectrum of differing identities where, um, like Leo said, you can be little to no sexual, um, you, or you can have little to no sexual attraction, um, or you can have a medium amount, like there's no set uh, number, there's no, there's no science to record how sexual you are. Um, I mean, maybe one day there is, I will always, you know, I could be wrong. But um, essentially, there, uh, this term gray sexual just highlights the fact that there are spectrums among spectrums among spectrums. So um, speaking of, Leo, would you share about breaking the binary spectrum? Sure. So the next on our list is non-binary. So the sort of simplest definition of this is somebody who does not identify as male or female, and they see themselves outside of the gender binary completely. Um, that being said, sometimes people who are transmasculine, like myself, they might also identify with the term non-binary, or like for instance, when I describe myself a lot of the time, I'll say I'm a non-binary transmasculine person, because in this case, it's like I am transmasculine, coming from a femme state, I guess, to a masculine one. Um, but I also sort of acknowledge that I identify outside of the gender binary as well. I'm not really super concerned with becoming or appearing or presenting or living like a typical like cisgender man, for instance. Um, so non-binary is definitely a term that has gotten more popular in recent years. Um, I think a lot of people are really identifying with this idea that you don't have to sort of be beholden to either of these gender. I think it rings true for a lot of people because it is just, it, there's something about it that I think feels very natural for a lot of people to be like, yes, I am, I am outside the gender binary. And we see a lot of really amazing things from non-binary people as well. I feel like people who are non-binary are always the ones who are like just 
just like knocking doors down and doing all sorts of fabulous things because they're already done with the gender binary. So they're just like, what else do you got for me? I'm going to take it all. I'm going to rebuild everything. Um, and sometimes non-binary is shortened to NB or NB, you might hear. So that's E-N-B-Y. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, non-binary folks smash all of the things. Um, Joyelle, would you share gender non-conforming uh, and gender queer? So gender non-conforming refers to someone who expresses their gender outside traditional norms associated with masculinity or femininity. And not all gender non-conforming people are transgender, and some transgender people express gender in conventionally masculine or feminine ways. Um, and then gender queer is another term that's often used to describe someone whose gender identity is outside the strict male-female binary. They may exhibit both traditionally masculine and feminine qualities, or neither. And I think all of these terms we're talking about non-binary or gender non-conforming or gender queer. Um, and I'm just going to skip forward one more to gender fluid, uh, which is a term used by people whose identity shifts or fluctuates. So sometimes they may identify or express themselves more masculine and some days they might express themselves more feminine. And all of these are, are offering up more possibilities than uh, the traditional subscribing of certain characteristics or ways of dress uh, with either being assigned to feminine or masculine. And one simple example of that is the color pink used to be uh, actually ascribed masculine. It is currently ascribed feminine. And all of these gender queer, gender fluid, or gender non-conforming are saying, you know, I get to decide what my gender expression is and I'm not going to follow the old rules. Hmm. Um, that's, a, that's often a question I get about uh, identifying as a trans person and non-binary is when people say, um, oh, but I, I, or I tell people that I'm non-binary and they say, oh, but I thought you were trans. I like to say, oh, don't worry, I wear pants too. I wear pants, I wear <laughs> dresses, I, I wear different clothes. So don't worry, I'm not just a trans woman. I'm a non-binary trans woman. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it's, it's interesting that as soon as you point out just one little thing, um, I often get cis women responding to me mostly saying, well, I don't shave my legs or I don't shave my armpits. I rebel in this way or this way. And I say, that's fantastic. That's amazing that you are making your own choices for your body because that's how it should be. Um, no one has the right to tell you whether or not you should do something or shouldn't do something, um, especially when it comes to uh, gender and sexuality. Um, we, we also have a staff member who uh, got a short haircut and somebody says, oh, you're so brave for getting a short haircut and being a woman, um, as if it, it's unheard of that women can have short hair. Um, like it's a miracle that you just discovered mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes uh, we might not know everything, um, but when we talk about uh, new terms as well as old terms, um, what I wanna leave you on is the word they, them, there, or the pronoun they, them, there. Um, a lot of people ask, uh, what does this mean because to them, they think if you say they just walked in, that means there are multiple people. This is actually an incorrect uh, belief. It's an ahistorical, non-factual uh, thing to say um, because it implies that you don't read books. And uh, although I, am, I can only name Eurocentric books, uh, Dickens, Austin, Shakespeare, a lot of English literature uses they them there in the singular sense um they all they all do it and so when people say oh but you know that's the one thing about the community i just can't get with is using they them there to refer to someone when it's just one person and i always say sweetie pick up a book you've got to do the work because it does not work to invent an opinion that just is ahistorical. 
Um, so if you go back into English language, there are tons of examples of non-gendered uh, they, them, their usage. But as we've noted before, English is not like a great language to capture all of these experiences. And English has maybe the least amount of gender neutral experiences and verbs and nouns. Um, in a lot of other languages, there, uh, in some languages, there is even no separation between men or women. It's all they, them, their pronouns, so to speak. Um, so it's important to recognize that if you're coming from that perspective of, well, it's the grammar for me, um, consider grammar of other languages and consider English grammar in its uh, English colonial history. Even from that perspective, it's still wrong. So do check your work. Um, oh, and I guess the plus we could go over, but it really just plus means plus more. I would hope that that is clear. When we say trans plus people, um, that gener generally includes transgender, transsexual, transcending identities. Um, similarly to us, LGBTQ plus uh, refers to the many different identities from within that. So those are all the letters. Those are all of the things that uh, we could think of naming at North Van Arts. Um, but we can open it up to some questions now. If there are any, feel free to add in the chat. Um, any questions are okay, but I will always tell you whether a question is not okay. That's kind of my deal with my audiences. Uh, as a performer, usually when I'm in person, I will always say, you can ask any question, but I might not answer it. Um, so if we choose not to answer a question, um, just respect that, know that that's a valid experience. Um, because sometimes you can just learn it online just as easily. Um, you can Google these things. Uh, but while you have us here, there any folks? You know, I'd like to add in about they, them pronouns, because I know a lot of people really struggle with getting used to using these terms. Uh, and one thing that I found helpful is to start whenever you're out for a walk somewhere or you're out in public and you see a lot of people, just think to yourself in your head, oh, I like their shirt. Oh, isn't their dog cute? You know, and just get in the habit of using it in your head so that it becomes more natural to you. Because the reason it feels unnatural is just because most of us have not done that for a large part of our lives and it's just something new that we're trying to adjust to uh, and I still slip all the time and use the wrong pronouns um, and I think maybe one thing that we could talk about Andy is what do you do when you slip up and you use the wrong pronoun because this is a really important topic mm -hmm. that's a good a good one um, and I love your your practice homework for the public um that yeah that's a really great way to do it because yeah it's a dog walker it's um not necessarily your family member whose full experience you are aware of mm -hmm. um leo would you like to answer this about uh what to do when someone might misgender you or use a different pronoun than the one that is your pronoun I, I will preface that this probably varies a little bit depending on the person, but I would say in general, um, good form is to, as soon as you notice it, quickly apologize, say the correct pronoun to sort of reinforce it for yourself and reiterate it for anybody else who might be listening and quickly move on. Don't, I think it, it's quite awkward if, like, for instance, I've had it where somebody used the wrong one and then you know, the, it, they halted the whole conversation and waited for me to, and waited to like apologize to me and have me be like, oh no, it's okay, before we then moved on. And that sort of makes it, if anything, a little bit more of a stressful and awkward situation. It's like, I accidentally have used the wrong name or pronouns for cisgender people. You know, it's like, if you just acknowledge it as a mistake that we all can make and move on just like you have made when I accidentally call my brother by my cat's name or something like that. It's like, just correct yourself, apologize, move on quickly. And I think Joelle's point about practice is a really great one. If you there is somebody in your life that whose pronouns you're struggling with, definitely recommend just like 
practice doing it um, by yourself at home, it's really important to be using the correct ones, I would say mentally. Like I would say, if you're thinking about them and you notice yourself using the wrong ones, correct yourself in your head, use the right ones going forward. Cause then it will just become more natural to do it out loud as well. Oh, and we have a great question in the chat. Do you want to take mm -hmm. that one, Andy? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and just to add to uh, misgendering, I like to think, um, or I like to share with people that we also misgender each other. So within the community, we also mix up each other's pronouns by accident. We make mistakes. Uh, it, it goes along with being human. And that's uh, what we will always understand of you as well. Um, so like Leo said, not making it as big of a scene. Um, think of it like, you know, when your parents call you by your sibling's name. Um, this happened to me a lot. I come from a big family. There's a lot of names. And um, when your parents call a kid by the wrong name, you correct yourself. You repeat it so that, you know, for anyone else to hear. And then uh, you don't make a scene about it. Otherwise, it'll make things worse. And <laughs> they'll get more upset or who knows what and why and all that stuff. It's just best to move on. So uh, question here, is it appropriate to ask for someone to share their trans story? Um, it's a great question because uh, depending on how well you know them, um, that can be uh, the answer right there. Um, I would say if you are close friends um, with somebody, it is definitely okay to ask uh, for them to share about their experience and uh, to share a bit more about their story or their journey. Um, like we've said, there are a lot of ups and downs. Um, however, if you are someone who doesn't know any trans people or you've never met a trans person that you know of, um, if you uh, don't know anyone and don't know where to start. I think it's really important that you actually don't ask people for extremely personal details. Um, let's say if this is someone at the grocery store or the nail salon, uh, it's maybe not the best time to ask about what their uh, experience with non-binariness might be like or to, to clarify something for you, um, to sort of do your homework for you. Um, those are not the spaces in grocery stores and the general spots. Um, I would always say if you're, if you have like a one-on-one -on -one with a trans person, that's probably the best, safest space where you can ask, um, about their story. And I would even say, go one further, ask for consent if it's okay to ask about their, their, uh, let's say their medical history ask if it's okay to talk about their body, ask if it's okay to talk about their dating history, for example. Um, that one time someone was like, so now that you're trans, does this mean that you're straight? And I was like, um, it's a lot to unpack. Maybe not for right now, we could talk about it, but definitely at a later date. Um, or you could research this, that uh, you know, depending on how well you know someone, um, I, if they're your friend, yes, you would trust them and you can know. Um, but if, uh, if they're a complete stranger to you, definitely I do not recommend it. Um, but that's not to say that uh, you'll never meet or be friends with a trans person. Um, you can make friends with us as well. Um, and a lot of the ways you can do that are by going to and attending uh, a lot of queer and trans artists. Um, as we celebrate Pride this year, there are a ton of different events, uh, both virtual and in person, where you can see and interact with queer and trans people. Um, so there's a lot to check out. There's always a lot to do, uh, not only at Pride, but year round. So um, you can put that on your calendar if you'd like. It's a, a good reminder. Maybe for December, just write, think about Pride and what I can do, you know? Uh, little ways that you can incorporate pride more year round as opposed to just every summer. And I have to give a plug because the Queer Arts Festival is on right now uh, in Vancouver and I have some pieces in a show at the at the Sum Gallery for the Queer Arts Festival and there are several amazing events happening uh, in the next couple of weeks. So 
There are many opportunities in this community. We are very fortunate to have uh, such a strong uh, queer community and queer organizations putting together events like this. So there's no excuse to be ignorant about the queer community if you live in the greater Vancouver area. <laughs> mm -hmm. Talking to you, North Shore. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I grew up here, I can say it. We'll see. <laughs> we'll find out later, I guess. Um, <laughs> But with uh, that in mind, as we are nearing uh, 8 p.m., well, we already did near 8 p.m., but um, we're going to close off this event and uh, let folks know that if you want to learn more about the work that we are doing at North Van Arts um, on the North Shore Culture Compass.ca, you can see some of the work that Leo has been working on this year um, in Camp Creative and in um, uh, our arts education programming. You can find a lot of uh, what Joyelle does for North Van Arts. Um, and in terms of where I will be, I'll be all over the place. Um, but you can mostly find out about uh, our workshops, our uh, programs, our exhibitions and events, uh, all at northvanarts.ca or at northvanarts on social media. So thank you everyone for joining us and we hope you have an amazing day. Bye, y'all. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everybody. <laughs>